good afternoon to everybody else here in this area. Welcome to this uh, audio um, webinar. It's not really a webinar, but uh, it's going to be a, a meeting about audio. Um, I'm sure you all enjoyed the opening music very much, which is proof how important that audio is. Um, but without much further ado, we're going to go to the, the heart of uh, this topic. Um, my name is Mathieu van Buhl. I'm, I'm a producer since many years, uh, so I struggled with, with all aspects of audio and video. And um, I think I, that uh, I learned that audio cannot be underestimated. Its importance is absolutely essential. I, I don't know. I was looking, in fact, for who, uh, who had given that quote, um, uh, that video is uh, audio with images or video is radio with images. But it's an old quote, which for me describes very well how important that audio is in, in every media because it often is the, the main carrier of the, the content. Uh, another uh, quote that I remember is, is from my dad. He said that you can see football much better on the radio than in, in on television, uh, which also shows you how, how important that is. Well, I think you're here, so you probably all find audio important, but audio is also very challenging because it's, it's not something that it's easy to see it's not something objective when when there's something wrong with the camera everybody sees it because everybody's looking over the shoulder of the cameraman on the monitor and something and you can see it's underlit or it's overexposed or it's not sharp or it's badly framed or something well audio is magic there's a guy with a headset on and he does things and everybody is just hoping that it's going to be okay talking about headsets maybe it's a good idea for all of you to maybe run away for 30 seconds and get yourself a headset because it's better to enjoy the audio of this meeting also in full quality to maybe better hear what our very distinguished speakers are going to say before that i want to start with a, a little uh, exercise for you all i'm going to show you a little bit of an a clip and i would like you to uh, to say in the survey that I'm going to launch afterwards, what you would do with this. The, here is the task. Um, there is this professor who is going to make a very short promotion clip for his very important conference. And he uh, he has an idea, etc. He goes, he does it, he comes back and he tells you, please make the best of it and then distribute it on all the channels to make a, an advertisement. And here is the result. Your this is what you're getting. As president of the European Society of Bionic Endoscopy, um, I would like at the end to invite you uh, to join us in our next annual congress in Brussels next October. Um, you remember the last video message from my friend Antigone Spedio in Bernetis to promote also this event. So that's why for me it was impossible to not propose to you all the mountains and we are here in the French Seven Mountains, the Blue Mountains, you see just over there the German Seven. After the success of Lisbon, we wanted to overcome the limits and uh, we work a lot during the last six months with all the scientific committee and I have to thank all of them, specifically to say hello to Charles, Antigo, Spedio and Mathieu Stamos, but also the Congress President Michel Dizot and also our executive manager Bruno Fanti I think you have seen enough probably to make yourself a little bit of an idea and now I would like to hear from you what are what are your ideas what are you going to do here is a couple of questions uh, here is a question that I want to ask you what would you do in your position if you get this case in front of you I see some ideas coming in. Quite mixed. Well, most sensible is indeed sending the team and the professor back. Subtitling, second position. Overdub in the studio is now head to head with subtitling in second position, but quite far behind. We sent the team and professor back. So I think the race is run. 
you sent the professor and the team back for a reshoot. Okay, very good. Let's see at the end of this uh, program, if you change your mind, maybe we were going to try. And for that, we have a couple of distinguished speakers. Our first speaker is Nick van den Berg. He's from MIT in the States. So very good morning to you, Nick. Uh, Nick is a man of many talents. He's a video producer, editor, composer, even with a couple of uh, official selections for Sundance and for the, the Biennale di Venezia. So um, I think we, uh, we are going to listen with a lot of interest, Nick, to what you have to tell us from your long time experience. Nick is going to lead us a little bit through the basics, the essentials of audio as he sees it, but of course with a view on uh, the, the media that will come of it, content later. And then our colleagues from Edinburgh, they will uh, take over from Nick after Nick's presentation. Nick, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, let me share my screen real quick. Can everyone see that okay? Great. Um, <clears throat> so I guess I'm, I've kind of chosen to talk a little bit about, um, well, the, I, the title of my talk is Reducing Noise in Educational Media. So um, I, most of my work at MIT is kind of focused on um, turning classroom classes into online classes. So it's mostly, um, you know, uh, talking heads with slides and animations and stuff. Um, and because audio in that setting is uh, seemingly so simple, it's really important uh, to make sure that the voice is is clear and there isn't any noise and i guess for my talk um i'm kind of defining noise as anything that distracts you from from understanding clearly what um what a faculty member is is talking about so there's me again um so here's a brief brief overview of what i'm going to talk about so uh kind of in two sections so production while you're recording uh how microphone choice uh, can affect the quality of a sound, and then also where you put a microphone. And then in post-production, um, some different ways to process audio once it's recorded, and uh, when to do that processing during the editing process. And there we go. Um, so this this might be a a, a, a debatable <laughs> opinion, uh, but for it's my opinion in this kind of situation that the most important thing when placing a microphone or choosing a microphone is the signal to noise ratio. So the um, the example with the wind was really great to kind of illustrate this point. I think if if the phone had been a little closer to the speaker and that the uh, voice was a little louder relative to the wind noise and background noise, it would be a lot easier to clean up. Um, but since it's so quiet, it's actually really difficult to get rid of that wind noise. Um, so when thinking about microphone choice, it can really change. Um, it can really, I don't know what I'm saying. Uh, the microphone choice can dramatically change the signal to noise ratio. So it's just something to think about if you have multiple microphones to choose from. Uh, so I guess some of this is pretty basic stuff, but um, hopefully this won't be too boring for, for some of you who knew, know more things than others. Um, so basically you have two different choices of microphones and it kind of depends on if you're in a studio filming a professor or if someone's filming from home, uh, which microphone you would want to choose. So you have dynamic microphones, um, which is kind of like what I'm speaking into now, uh, or condenser microphones, which are powered and more, um, more sensitive have more detail, uh, but they also, because of that, can pick up more background noise, more more of the room sound, um, which can be distracting. Um, and then you can also choose uh, your microphone based on the polar pattern, so how how directional uh, the pickup is. Um, so here's here's an example, um, kind of showing you a few different microphones that are kind of common. Um, uh, so I guess while I'm playing this, listen to the uh, particularly the background sound and how it 
uh, how it changes from microphone to microphone, the the level of the sound versus the voice, and also just kind of the quality of the sound as it changes. Uh, here you go. This is a boring audio test. Please ignore what I'm saying and listen to the sound of it instead, over and over. And over. This is a boring audio test. Please ignore what I'm saying and listen to the sound of it instead, over and over. And over. This is a boring audio test. Please ignore what I'm saying and listen to the sound of it instead, over and over. And over. This is a boring audio test. Please ignore what I'm saying and listen to the sound of it instead, over and over. And over. This is a boring audio test. Please ignore what I'm saying and listen to the sound of it instead, over and over. And over. This is a boring audio test. Sorry about that. It's not, we don't need to listen to that boring audio test more than once. Um, so I think one of the interesting things in that is that, um, you know, the, the Sheps microphone, which is, which is great for location recording uh, indoors uh, or an interview situation where the microphone is out of the frame. Um, it sounds pretty good, but you also get a little bit of the room kind of ambience, a little more than I kind of like actually. Um, Whereas the SM57 is a, a very inexpensive dynamic mic. Um, and if you can have it in the shot, like I have this mic right now, it actually ends up sounding just as good as a mic that costs, you know, 10 or 15 times more. Um, and it's a little easier to use. Um, I don't know. There, and, and it will also last forever, which is a great, great thing. They're kind of hard to break. Um, so I guess that's, uh, I'm pointing that out because, um, you know, if you have a professor speaking, recording from home, a lot of times people will just record straight into their uh, laptop, which ends up being six feet away from them. And all you hear is room noise and kind of echoey sound. It's kind of tinny sounding. But if you, you know, spend a, a very small amount of money, you could put a little microphone in front of their face and it would sound incredible. Um, so here I'm going to play a couple more examples for you. Um, uh, so a polar pattern with different microphones, you have, um, how exactly to explain this? Um, so I guess depending on uh, the application, you can choose a microphone that's either more directional, more directional or less directional. Um, and if you've never looked at a, a polar pattern kind of diagram like this, this is a, a cardioid design. Um, and so this is where the, the pickup the microphone will pick up. So it's going to pick up directly in front of the microphone, the best, a little less well from the side um, and kind of off axis to the side, the the sound will actually change a little bit. You'll still pick it up and it'll change. And then from behind the microphone here, um, it's going to reject a lot of sound. Um, and so this is a super cardioid pattern, which is what the, uh, the Sheps was and what the microphone I'm talking on now is. And so the null is actually to the side uh, in the back. So it will pick up directly from behind, but off to the sides a little bit, it'll reject things. And so that's useful because if there's, um, if there's a particular sound you're trying to, you, you can't silence, you can't, you know, turn an air conditioner off or you can't, um, you know, there's a sound outside that you can't actually turn off. You can place the microphone so that the null is facing whatever that noise is and it'll dramatically reduce, um, the level of that sound. Uh, so if you're recording a, a, you know, a bluegrass ensemble, for instance, and the banjo is too loud, you can put the microphone that's on the bass with the null facing the banjo, and then you'll actually hear the bass instead of the banjo. Uh, so here are uh, a couple examples. This is just using an SM57. Uh, and I, when I play them, should describe what you're hearing. This is an audio test with the MicTech C5 with a cardioid capsule pointed directly at an air conditioner. And then here we go. This is with the microphone turned with the null facing the air conditioner. This is an audio test with the MicTech C5 with the null of the cardioid capsule pointed directly at the air conditioner. Great. So I think um, you can still hear the audio um, or you can still hear the noise, but I think uh, 
especially when uh, processing them after the fact, it is uh, several dB quieter, which will make the um, which will make the file a lot easier to work with. So it's not perfect, but it's definitely better. Um, so here, I, I I guess to illustrate that, um, I went ahead and did uh, some noise reduction on both of them, and I I hope you'll be able to hear that. Uh, the one that I processed where the microphone is pointed directly at the um, air conditioner will have a lot more uh, kind of un unpleasant artifacts. So it's it's clean-ish, but it's not as as clean as the um, one where I used the null. So I think this is the one with the null pointed at the air conditioner. This is an audio test with the MicTech C5 with the null of the cardioid capsule pointed directly at the air conditioner. And then here's the next one. This is an audio test with the MicTech C5 with a cardioid capsule pointed directly at an air conditioner. So I hope that came across. Uh, um, so I guess, uh, so now once you've recorded things and you're moving on to the editing process, um, I end up doing a lot of editing of kind of interviews and presentations and things where, um, you know, it's all filmed in one, one setting. So you don't have, uh, multiple locations or anything like that. So all of the audio is basically recorded the same way. Um, and I've kind of found that for me, the best workflow is to import all of that footage and then, uh, do a batch process on all of the audio all at once so that while you're editing, um, you have access to clean audio. Because I think the temptation, at least, you know, in more creative things is to wait to do that until the very end. Um, but in, uh, you know, doing courses like the ones I work on, we end up with a lot of, uh, a lot of revisions, and then you would end up having to redo that work over and over again. So I kind of encourage doing you know, uh, a blanket kind of noise reduction and um, uh, loudness normalization across all of those files. So they're consistent and they sound good in the um, in the rough cut. And then you can you can edit around those. And then if you end up with any, um, you know, particular uh, noise problems, any specific things you want to uh, focus on, you can do that in the in the fine cut and the final cut. And then uh, finally, this is a little a little tip uh, when mixing and and mastering that I came up with uh, called mat slap, uh, which stands for monitor at the same level always, please. Um, and so basically, what this means is uh, while you're mixing or or mastering audio, if you um, make sure that your listening environment is as consistent as possible, which includes you know. Uh, you know, if you're working on monitor speakers or if you're using headphones, uh, doing lots of referencing on those headphones or speakers so you know what good audio should sound like. And then when you're mixing, don't change your your the level of your, you know, the volume in your headphones all the time because it'll it'll really quickly confuse you. Like our ears are kind of stupid, and you will you can convince yourself of anything. Like uh, if you're if you're mixing and you're like I'm gonna change change an EQ on this voice and you start moving things around and you're like, I think that sounds a little better. And then a minute later, you realize that it's the wrong EQ. That's a different channel. You haven't changed anything, but you can tell yourself that you're making changes. Um, so it's really important to make sure you know exactly what you're doing and you're not uh, kind of changing things around. Uh, and, and also if you do that, you can just, it, you'll intuitively know, oh, this sounds good or this doesn't sound good, and I know what I need to change because you've been doing it exactly the same way every time. Uh, and I believe that is the end. So if you have any questions, um, I don't know how how clear the presentation was, but I, uh, all of those topics are things that I could talk about uh, all day long. Um, so if anything wasn't clear, I'd be more than happy to to answer questions.
Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, we are going to come back at the end uh, of, of the whole uh, program with some questions. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that there will be some questions, but I, I'm taking the privilege now to ask you a quick question. Um, I'm a bit surprised that, that you launch immediately with talking about microphones and, and so on. Um, in, in my experience, my, my very first step is always to, to see is this the right place to record the audio in? So, for example, I, I listen to the room and say, maybe you should move to another place or maybe you put yourself in another place in the room. Would that be your first step too? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, that that's kind of, it, it is the first step in the chain of recording. So um, if it's too echoey, you can put rugs down or you can use blankets or something to, if, if you can't move, there are a lot of things you can do to improve the room. Um, yeah, I kind of chose to, to talk with, or to talk about microphones because um, it seems like that's the thing that a lot of video people don't have access to. You know, a lot of, you know, they'll have one or two microphones, but not necessarily a locker full of things that they're familiar with. Um, and, and also because a lot of times uh, in the video kind of work that I end up doing, changing location isn't actually an option. You kind of get a room and that's the room you're in. Um, and you kind of just have to make the, the best of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'm sure there will be more questions at the end, but now let's go uh, to uh, Conrado and uh, Lucy from uh, Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, and they're going to take it one step further, and they're going to introduce us a little bit more in the, the content of the audio. What can you do with all this nice technology? So Lucy and Conrado, please, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, thanks for being here. It's lovely to share this time with you. Um, so yes, we're, we're Conrado and Lucy. We are, can you, first of all, I'm assuming you can all hear me. Yes. Um, so hi. We are media producers um, for a part of Harriet Watt called Harriet Watt Online. We develop moving image and sound content for our courses. Um, coincidentally, uh, we both also happen to have uh, both undergraduate and postgraduate degrees in music and sound related disciplines. And so hopefully that's evidence enough that we do really care about sound and how it's applied to learning environments. So I'm going to start with the recording. It's about a minute. Um, I encourage you to switch your cameras off and just take a moment um, to listen and connect. So welcome back. Um, that, in fact, was a, a little sonic postcard we created to share with you or to, you know, nurture the potential for connection with you beyond, you know, this, this potentially sterile environment on Zoom and certainly a remote environment on Zoom. So that was an audio recording taken from uh, the campus grounds, which are here. That's a, broadly where the recordings were taken. And um, as I say, it was our intention to offer a little bit of connection with us in one way or another, or certainly possibly even connection with yourself through engaging with the uh, sounds of nature. There is now even scientific evidence that that has, a pos that that has positive psychology effects on humans. 
a um, little bit of acoustic ecology there. The, the woodlands have not have not changed um, uh, in over 200 years. You can see the canal at the top that I'm looking at on from my house now, that in fact I cycle into campus on. Um, you can see the roads. This is a map of about 200 years old. You know, the roads that we engage with to get into campus and there's even one of the train lines. So you're learning a little bit about us and offering through sound um, a way of connecting a little bit with us um, as the composer and um, acoustic ecologist Marie Schaefer said, touch is the most personal of the senses and hearing is a way of touching at a distance. A few kilometers away, north, this is in fact Conrado's um, uh, middle son sailing. Now, if he worked against the wind, he'd be causing himself unnecessary barriers to getting where he wants to go. You know, you could argue that in fact, what he's doing is he's working with the affordances of wind, right? And I think that um, this notion of friction, um, and, and, Nick, and Nick qualified it in his talk about talking about noise being the thing that's getting in the way of engagement. Um, this notion of friction is when we're not working with the affordances of the medium we're working in. In this case, we're talking about sound. Um, and in fact, you know, working well with sound is in fact increasing the potential for connection, increasing the potential for access to the broadest amount of people. So, you know, it benefits everybody to be working with integrity and to the best of your possible ability by not creating un certainly unnecessary barriers to engagement. So if we hop back to the canal, this is in fact me cycling out of campus along the canal. Now, I'll be honest, um, don't shoot me, but actually what, when it's quiet on the canal, I do have half an ear in a podcast. And, if, and I can tell you that the, the most frictionful experiences I have where I turn off from connecting with that stuff, and I love connecting with audio only uh, resources. I do a lot of my processing of information that way, is anything that is, already slightly more challenged um, through the quality of the recording or the quality of my speakers, as soon as it is masked by something like a really noisy environment or public environment like this, um, I start to switch off. Um, so really it's another way of encouraging, uh, particularly you, particularly people that need to make arguments to say leadership as to why you're taking that extra time to work you know, with integrity with your content and with audio recordings is that it really is to, you know, if they don't really understand or they start to think it's about being creative or, you know, uh, and needlessly so, it's actually really about accessibility. We're designing for humans here. And there's, I think there's an ethical responsibility here to, to, to not um, be creating environments that don't work um, uh, from the outset, really. Um, our particular uh, sort of challenge uh, where we work is that we are seen to be the sixth of Harriet Watts campuses. Um, you could see the other five as sort of, you know, on the ground and we are sort of in the cloud <laughs> online. Um, and we really do use sound to, to nurture a sense of, you know, to, to presence, human presence online um, and you know there are many bits of say an institutional strategy that will 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 talk about wanting to nurture connections um i mean here's just one snippet from ours um you know where they're, they're talking about a single organization where geographical location does not limit staff or student opportunities and given that all of our students are working online um, and that digital media, in fact, is becoming an increasingly central part of all learning. Um, th th there's, there's all the more reason to make sure that those experiences aren't full of uh, friction for the learner. Here, in fact, is where we have put that little sonic postcard in um, a business course at the point of repose, sort of halfway through their course, as a number of resources to sort of offer a little bit of ourselves. It's a little test that me and the team are working on um, to, to encourage people indeed to take their own, should we say analog sound walk using their own ears and getting up off the laptop. Um, and I'll just play you a few seconds of how it looks within the course.
So in fact, it's um, at the moment we are hindered by not actually ironically being able to play audio only resources. So we shared a little bit of the environment in which it was filmed too there. And we're really at the embryonic stage of um, wondering if we can test that way of nurturing a sense of sort of human community remotely and globally by um, you know, testing the idea of a sound mapping project. Here's one, there are many, and I, when I share my notes with Dovi, I'll share a few you know, really rich mapping, sound mapping resources that are around. Um, and so you know, if you'd like to help us test that and create your own sonic postcards for us, do get in touch. But I'm gonna hand over to Conrado now, who's gonna talk more specifically about our, you know, our approaches to sound within learning materials. Um, so I'll stop showing my screen and hand over to my friend. There we go. Okay, uh, thank you, Lucy. Uh, so I'll just share my screen and continue the chat. Uh, let me just find... And please let me know if you can't hear this stuff I'm going to be sharing. Just wait for me a moment. I'm just going to move that piece here. Right. Can you all see the black screen? Okay, excellent. So the bulk of what I'm going to say is about audio pieces as opposed to audio for video. That's not to say that the ideas I'll present here are not helpful to visual content. Uh, I think most of them are. But before I start, I'd like to play you something. This is a piece we produced for a course called Workplace Design and Human Factors. It's a very simple piece. We've, it's got very few elements, but I believe it illustrates some of the points I'll be talking about. Uh, this media is aimed at setting the scene for a module on anthropometrics, uh, a bit of a tongue twister word. For those of you who aren't familiar with the term, Anthropometrics is the practice of taking measurements of the body in a systematic way. It's mainly used for designing products where the dimensions of the human body uh, are very important. So here you go. And please let me know if you can hear it. <laughs> You're shivering. You're on the deck of a ship at night. It's cold, dark and foggy. And as you make your way to your cabin, you hear someone whistling an enchanting tune. But you see only their vague silhouette in the dull moonlight. The figure in the mist is no sooner seen than gone. But snippets of the tune continue to play in your head when you wake up next morning. And you want to know what it is. No one recognises your sad attempts to repeat it, so you must track down the stranger. What did they look like, you're asked. How tall were they? So uh, why audio pieces can at times be the right choice? I mean, audio pieces as opposed to video with audio. The first thing I'd like to say is audio has an immense power to create immersive environments. Uh, the first entry in the Cambridge Online Dictionary says for immersion, the fact of becoming 
completely involved in something. And about sound fostering immersion, Gabor Cespegri, I'm not really sure how to pronounce that name, writes, uh, the acoustic sphere entails an element of possessiveness. We are seized by sounds and delivered to their influence. Why would you want this to happen when producing audio for education? Well, uh, I think that great part of what we do as media producers for education is to create content that will help, help students remember, to recall that content when they need it, possibly when they are doing their exams or writing their dissertation. So, and the relation here is, if someone becomes totally immersed in something, chances are that something will be remembered. Naturally, uh, an immersive environment can be created on, in a video format. Uh, I argue, however, that to produce a satisfactory immersive environment via video, the production budget and time to produce the content would be, in most cases, uh, prohibitive. So let's refer back to the piece I started the chat. To recreate it satisfactory with moving images, we would need a lot of time and probably a lot of money. We'd need a ship to begin with, to film on, a foggy night. Those of us who work with media know that the weather tends not to play ball when we want something from it. Second point, sound pieces have the power to let the listener visualize the scene, making it their own, so to speak, based on their own experience. While a video is likely to constrain it to the imagination of the director. And here is possibly a paradox. Without the visual distraction, it also directed the focus back into the content. This is something that has been in the minds of educators for centuries. It's said that Pythagoras delivered his lectures from behind the curtain so that his students would listen without the visual distraction. Uh, actually, Lucy and I, when we were talking about the chat today, yeah, that was yesterday, we both experienced on Teams and Zoom calls the urge to look away from the screen to better concentrate on the call. Uh, maybe later on, when we have a chat as a group, it would be good to know if any of you have that experience as well. Also, possibly linked to fostering a free range of the imagination. Audio pieces seem to afford, more than video pieces, uh, breathing spaces, where a tail end of a sound, for example, can last for quite a while, leaving room for the listener to reflect about, about what has just been heard. In a video piece, especially without sound design or music, it will probably be perceived as a bad edit, and consequently be perceived as a lack of care for, in our case, the student, which in turn brings all sorts of bad vibes that nobody wants, such as poor student retention. Sound pieces encourage active listening. Salome Vogelin, in the book Listening to Noise and Silence, said, Left in the dark, I need to explore explore what I hear. Listening discovers and generates the heart. I'll just have a sip of water now. The way I read this is like that. To fill in the gaps left by the lack of visual information, we imagine the visuals, making them personal, potentially making stronger the connection to the material. And here we go back to make something memorable that I mentioned, mentioned earlier and how important that is to education. If, for example, the faculty you are working for, you are producing content for, wants their students to experience something without the need to analyze it in the first instance, sound pieces can be just the key to it. As an example of this, I would like to play you a piece this was created for a module on the Psychology of Leadership course. 
the faculty wanted to put their students in the shoes of a leader on a moment of crisis as a way of setting the scene for the module. So they wrote a script where a group of people find themselves under attack and look up to their leader to find a way to safety. We produced the sound design for it, but the narrator was the academic himself. So let's play it. You wake up in a virtual world. The details are not important, but there is chaos all around. People are clinging to the ground. You see only fear in their eyes, with good reason, because they are being picked off one by one and melted horribly by an unseen force of uncertain origin. People are looking to you. You don't know why, but you know that safety lies underground. You know that the entrance to a tunnel is not far away. From the cacophony of sound, you hear someone call, What do we do now, boss? Uh, the next and last point about all the pieces only is a combined one, as they are intrinsically linked. All the pieces can be an antidote to screen fatigue. Uh, one doesn't need to look at the screen to hear things, which leads to educational content, which can be listened to. For example, as one does their weekly shopping, or like Lucy mentioned, leaving work, going back home, and listening and learning. Uh, and all these, in turn, benefit longer pieces, such as podcasts. So now I would like to very quickly, uh, I've been, I feel it's been a bit long, uh, is just to, to share a few ideas for creating richer sound environments. Panning. Uh, just like in real life, the sounds come, come from all sorts of directions. So when you're creating something, perhaps place your sound files. Uh, in several places within the stereo, the left and right uh, uh, spectrum. Frequencies. As sound travels through the air, it loses energy. But this is not even across all frequencies. We lose high frequencies quicker than low frequencies as the distance increases. So the farther the sound is, in your imaginary environment, this environment you created in sound. So the farther it is, the more the higher frequencies are lost. So think about that when you're making your environment. Reverb, as a rule of thumb, the closer the sound source is to your ears, the less reverberation is heard. And the opposite is true. The farther it is, the more you hear its reflection on the walls of your imagined environment. Intensity, volume, just as he says on the team, I mean, uh, play with the different vo volumes in, within this, with the sound files you're using to create your environment. Variation. As a rule of thumb, variation is good, especially on long pieces. Consider recording on different locations, using different voices and accents, possibly different recording conditions. Of course, this is if it fits with the script you're using. Possibly record parts of a long conversation in the studio, parts of it in a coffee shop or in a car or through the telephone. Manipulate your sound files in post-production, possibly add music. So make that long podcast feels like passed quick, quickly. Okay, having said all this about all the only pieces, I would like to conclude by raising one important point about sound for video. And is and is this sound flashes out the visual and renders it real. It gives the image its spatial dimension and temporal dynamic. Uh, so 
I'm going to send you a link on the Zoom chat just now. It's And that's going to be the final thing, I promise. It's for a few seconds of a talk with Graham Wild, who was the main audio producer for Planet Earth 2 by the BBC. Uh, I think that what he says illustrates this quote. I just play, I put on the screen. Uh, the link should take you to the re relevant point, but uh, you might see an advert beforehand. And my apologies for that. Uh, uh, is uh, is on YouTube and you get these things. Uh, the whole thing is very interesting, but please watch it only until two minutes and eight seconds. But the whole thing from the point I'm, as, uh, it should take you, it should be less than a minute. So I'll come back to, to you to finalize the talk just uh, after this, uh, after a minute or so. So I'll stop sharing now and I'll send you that link. Just bear with me a moment. I'll get that link to you. So uh, I'm not sure if you Oh, can see the link? No? Conrado, you may have to put it in the, the group chat. Huh? Maybe you have not you have sent it to somebody in particular. So I don't see the ah, link okay. popping up. So in the two select meeting group chat so that everybody gets it. Okay, so if you just send... click enter, you may be responding to somebody. Ah, right. Okay. So... Trying to find this. Um, what about now? Am I still only sharing with someone? Not yet. Is it, yeah. is it in, in the chat? Uh, yeah, maybe I just replied to someone. I thought, I, yeah, I did click on the chat. Let me see if I. I don't see anything popping up yet. No. Chat. No. There we are. Graham Wild from Planet Earth. That's, That's it. That's the one. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So oh, thanks much. Now it's there. I think there for everybody.
I'll just give you a little extra time because I think someone didn't get the link to start with. Okay, and I think this is it. Thank you all for for listening. Thank you very much, Conrado. It makes us look at sound completely different. So it makes sound visible and tangible as you have demonstrated. Thank you also, Lucy. <laughs> this is very interesting. Um, I was wondering, Lucy, were you, you're not scared of driving into the canal? It looks a bit scary there, <laughs> especially when you're wearing uh, earphones yeah. or something. I knew, I, I knew I'd get told off. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I cycle responsibly for the record. <laughs> No, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's amazing, amazing decor and must be fascinating. Mm. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Makes, makes you really think about what you can do with sound, certainly also the last piece. So, okay, let's, let's open the, the floor for questions. I promise you I will also share the results of the, the, the survey uh, later on when, when there's no other questions. I suggest that we then look at the, the results and maybe also look at the result, in fact, of the video that, that I showed you in the very beginning. Okay, any questions for anybody? Uh, please, uh, you can open the microphone. I see nothing coming in the chat uh, for the time being, but otherwise open the microphone. And if everybody's too shy to ask a question, I will ask a first question to maybe to Lucy and, and, and Conrado. Um, yeah, I can see the power of audio in, in supporting learning, but how do you convince um, a teacher, a professor to go that extra step? because it makes them quite depending on the creativity and on the vision that, that specialists like yourself have. And it's a little bit like a step into the dark. It's abstract when you say somebody, oh, we're going to create soundscapes or we try to, to replace, in fact, the content purely into audio. How do you get your, your professors so far? You go for it, Lucy. <laughs> I, I spot, I spot, I, that was brinkmanship, wasn't it? Um, well, funnily enough, it was through lockdown that we gained more confidence about what we felt we could, in a realistic sense, push academics to do, you know, what was realistic to expect of them. And it was through that, um, that, that, that era that we tried and tested different bits of technology um, sort of low tech threshold, but where we could get their voice and then do creative things with it at this end. And that was a way around having a sense of tutor presence even throughout the lockdown. I have been in many circumstances where it's a much harder sell, but um, it, we are part of um, a kind of a, a team at the moment where it is our remit to make the media for the courses. So you already have a little bit of buy-in there anyway, because you're not starting from scratch with people. You are developing a relationship with them. And through that, that is how the trust comes. The truth of it is that actually, audio only is is actually um people can be camera shy and it and it's less intrusive in a sense as well so do you know what it's an easier sell than you might imagine um certainly because we can be very convincing about its pedagogical worth as well and so we can we can go in that way as well with it so it hasn't been as bad as it hasn't been as challenging as I think it might have been five, six, seven years ago. I think the the lockdown has helped with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally I second Lucy and and just definitely about trust. And as a course progress and we work, we are working in master's courses, so they they're they're long courses, and then. I would say that at the beginning is harder than at the end because the the faculty starts trusting our work, and and that helps. Mm -hmm, mm 
Yeah, I can see the, the, the influence of the lockdown when it would be probably very difficult to get a full production crew together, etc. more complicated. But then I'm a bit amazed, uh, Lucy, that you, you use the term low tech for audio. Would, so, does everybody agree with, with <laughs> low tech? Nick, would you agree with the use of low tech for audio? Um, maybe not low tech, but I think the um, technical, you know, the, the um, mechanical requirements are a little simpler. You know, you can you can do high quality audio for um, much cheaper than high the same quality video. Yeah, and also just to qualify, um, I meant at the academic end that there's been developments that I would have been more of a stickler for again a handful of years ago that actually um we tried and tested lots of kit and what we really needed to minimize her, her barriers to engagement really from the academics is things that you you know there's minimal um t technological requirements of them um and in fact some of the bits and bobs we used i mean almost look like toys but you know give gives rich you know if if you help them with uh, we we would direct remotely as well actually, so you know with camera camera placement things like that. Sorry, or uh, microphone placement things like that. Um, and then the high tech bits and bobs go on at our end if if required. Yeah, if I can just jump in for for example, this academic who are working on this course, all those uh, voiceovers you heard or the narration. Uh, they record themselves uh, and because they are based in Dubai and we are based in Edinburgh. So we actually bought a minimum piece of kit to send to them. We bought on the, I think it was Amazon Dubai or one such uh, place and we sent to, to the academic, you know, which was uh, an H1 recorder, a Zoom H1 recorder. Uh, and w along with uh, just like a, a PDF document, explain to them where to place that microphone to avoid popping noises and also to get a decent quality regarding the distance. So we made this document with pictures showing distances and stuff like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Lana, that. Lana, I see you raised your hand, please. Yes. Hi, Good everyone. morning. Lana Scott from MIT. I actually work with Nick. And I just wanted to make a comment following up Nick's presentation about trying to teach faculty to use these particular equipment. It always, it doesn't matter if you tell them like an, uh, this is the microphone you use, you literally have to show them. Like we literally say, okay, go do your thing with your little microphone and then come back and then it, it sounds horrible. And then we do our thing with our microphone. They're like, oh, but it takes so much convincing that we know audio and that, and people don't take it seriously. Like, especially when we were doing COVID and everyone was doing Zoom and we would tell people there are particular things that you should do if you're at home, how to set up your, we like made videos on how to set up your space, taught them how to do audio because we constantly are saying audio is the most important thing. Like it should be tattooed on our foreheads that it is the most, important thing and just it's a struggle almost and we try and keep it as simple as possible with the microphones that we recommend faculty so i don't know if anyone else goes through kind of that pain point a little bit with faculty and it's funny we work at a technology university one of the best and trying to teach <laughs> some yeah. faculty how to use the best microphones when they have nobel peace prize i'm like okay all right cool yeah, I mean, absolutely. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I think we all have that, but I wonder, I wonder sometimes whether there's some, some, something that's blocking people from understanding the importance of audio. Um, for example, I do a lot of remote recording, and one of my recommendations, not not recommendations, strong requirement is, please use at least a headset or something. But I don't know. I don't, I don't think people have ears. They don't listen to you. So never mind. Sorry, Dominic, you raised your hand. Uh, thank you, uh, Matthew. Thank you, everyone. That's been uh, really, really interesting to listen. And uh, I think I've probably got a comment more than a question. Um, it occurs to me that uh, 
our faculty, for example, or our students are probably very used to, um, for want of a better word, consuming audio, whether through music, through radio, through podcasts, through conversations, dialogue, etc. But um, particularly for staff, probably very, very unused to expressing themselves as educators via an audio only medium e even though in some ways education started as an audio only medium before the printing press <laughs> you know, back in the back in the day um and it's it's i suppose more more an observation listening to you know, it's fascinating hearing some of the materials that you've produced in edinburgh um, yet I can think of so few, if any, other examples of um, educators or design teams that have purposefully got, other than, you know, let's, let's do a podcast, for example, uh, that's a, that is an example, but who've gone for designed clips of audio to illustrate an educational point. You know, video is the go-to medium because you know it, it's multi-modal it's multi-sensory but leaving aside the accessibility question for those with hearing impairments it's a thoroughly unexploited educational medium <laughs> i think that's all it that's all i can yep. say that's a that's indeed a very good point yeah mm -hmm. sash good to see you again Thank you. Good to see you again. Um, the sound is great. Yeah. Oh, yes, it's it's the, the Rode NT1. <laughs> it's almost the same as the Neumann uh, U87. It's much more, uh, much more cheap than that. <laughs> Taking note. Great. Uh, I have a question about the music. I uh, see and hear a lot of instructional uh, videos that uh, use music, and I always learned... Uh, also from you, uh, Mati, that uh, music is not always uh, the best uh, thing uh, to use. And I think uh, Mayer also says something about uh, music and videos. What uh, do you think about uh, music? I think that's a question for you in Mayer Towards. One, one of the speakers, I don't know, maybe and maybe Maybe Nick, other Nick? people as well, yes. Yes. I, I take always the idea of using music with a pinch of salt because... Of course, especially when you're trying to create a, a course that is for, me, I mean, for a very varied, varied clientele, let's say. And music can be distracting. I think it needs to be, and also some, oh, what is good music for someone is bad music for another person. Music dates very quickly as well, unless you, I, I, have my theories if you have music that is uh recorded with acoustic in instruments they tend to have a long longer let's say shelf validity as they don't age as quickly but i i would use music very sparsely okay. Some, sometimes i guess it's needed but yeah nick you're a composer defend your case I, I agree with everything Conrado just said. It's extremely difficult. Um, yeah, and library music that is affordable and um, where you can get a license, uh, you know, to use it in perpetuity on multiple platforms and things. If something gets relicensed, you can still use the music. It's almost impossible to get stuff that's good. Um, and the amount of time it takes to write something is, is also uh, kind of prohibitive. Thank you. Thank you very much. But, but so, so do I understand it well that that you would n never start with an idea of let's get some music in this? So this is what, and what would cause you to use music in a production or in a lesson or something? What would urge it? Would it be the professor who says, "I would like to have some light background music," or is it is there something where you say, "I here we can do with music"? What what's the impulse? I, I think in my case is from all 
the stuff we, we produced in the past three years, I think uh, I used the music twice. Uh, well, there's that first scene, uh, uh, a place there, which was the whistle, but that doesn't count. It was part, it was in the script. Uh, but uh, I used generally to set a scene. In one case that I remember is uh, the, the academic is sitting in this French cafe. So it put a bit of gypsy jazz just at the entry of the, the thing. So if it's something that is related to the script, I would use music, but not if if you just want, uh, you know, that dynamic, that temporal dynamic to, to work. If uh, And I guess if you need the music to look like the edit is a good edit, it is the wrong way to, to go about. Mm. So... In my case, I would use music if it's related to the script. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Is that okay for you, Serge? Yes, you... very clear answers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alke, you have your hand up. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, so um, what Serge was saying uh, about the, the question about the music, we, um, I noticed that when I'm watching a video, any video, if the music is covering the narration, if, if it's simultaneous, then it really, I can't focus on what's being said. So when our professors ask us about it, we basically tell them, yeah, to set the scene at the beginning or sometimes like as an outro when you're showing the logo so that it's consistent through all the videos, but never like covering the narration, um, never simultaneously, that's basically what we advise them. Uh, um, and I also had a question for Serge. The, the microphone that you recommended, was it Rode 81? Uh, Rode NT1. I will uh, put it in the, in, the, okay. in the chat. Thank you. Um, yeah, and then the thing, what Lana was saying, what we also noticed that if you don't show the professors what you mean, they don't get it. So, um, I mean, just like you showed us at the beginning that that video, uh, I think if you want to demonstrate like the differences between microphones, it could really be as simple as to kind of just creating like a an audio clip where you compare it just like um, the first speaker did. Um, and the same with audio formats. We find that they just, they don't get it. They don't know what the possibilities are with audio. They automatically go to like a podcast as the only option. Um, and to help them not go straight to video because basically that is their first choice. They just have content and they want to put it in a video. Um, we're kind of trying to make like a decision aid now for them. I think it's possible. I haven't found it online, but it's, we're creating it now where you kind of have a decision aid between um, text, um, images, audio, and video. That's, that's the depth we want to go. Of course, you put all the video formats in the same kind of, um, kind of category now. It has to be refined, but that's what we want to make. And one of the things it hinges on and where I was like, um, I, I want your opinion on it is I was absolutely sure about this, but I, I wanna know how you feel about it. Um, I find that video and audio for me are not the best choice if you wanna present content that needs to be exhaustively known. I don't know if I'm being clear, like they have to know all the details for me. They have to know all the details. It's better to put that in a text. Would you agree to that? Like for the audio format as well? Yeah, they suit, they suit, everything suits. We can, we come around this a lot and um, the, the most simplest I've found to describe it or we try and describe it is use the best tool for the job. So we talk people out of media entirely quite a lot. <laughs> and then um, sometimes for certain people just s suggesting I don't know, what's the reason for turning the video on? What's the reason for the, you know, so even sometimes you can be devil's advocate and start with default audio um, and then say, what's the reason for turning stuff on? But I would say um, we tend to, um, you know, different modes suit different things. <laughs> and uh, I think audio certainly can carry longer form content better in inverted commas than video generally speaking um i think that we struggle with is um that we can't yet 
I, I would love to see a course that you could take completely onto your phone and not need to watch, you know, not need to have the interface, the kind of the, the VLE. And then that would open up loads more possibilities for kind of scaffolding courses around a podcast series, say. And then you could get into more nuanced, detailed content, you know what I mean? But it, you also need to think about the context in which people are engaging with any of this content, do you see what I mean? So whether it's through speakers, whether it's through headphones, whether it's through the digital screen, whether they're gonna print it off. So, so we, it's there's no one, we have found the more we got into it, and I can see Eric on the call as well, but the, there's no, uh, we were talking about DIY and how there's never really, it's never really DIY getting them to do stuff. And it's, uh, we found that general guides I would really love to um, see how you make that that decision tree, um, because these things are so useful, whilst also requiring a human to contextualize it always. And oh, general guides, general guides seem to be, a, sort of by default, assume a certain level of knowledge that, as we are all agreeing, just doesn't seem to be there. I think it's a huge ask to ask academics to suddenly become experts in in whatever, in this case, sound. On the other hand, institutionally, people need the support to have that space to not meet with the constant resistances, like Lana was was talking about. Um, but that's a very long-winded way of saying, uh, like, audio is very different to video and therefore suits different things. And both are different to text, and we often encourage text. We work with really great writers, actually, as well to make these courses. So that's we are able to confidently say, you know, work to 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 put this in a certain kind of voice with with this person for example as well so it's a we are in a slightly different setup to how i've been in other jobs where perhaps you just have to make it with that person and do what works with that sort of cultural resistance uh, we have a little bit more support network around conrado and me um uh, but yeah loads of detail stuff doesn't suit and sometimes we even say put it in text and that would work really well with a still graphic yeah, mm -hmm. that's what we're trying to. So, so and the the hint for me because I I I, I consulted lots of um, lots of sources about it, but there's never a decision tree. And of course, if we do land in the kind of decision tree slash aid, we would kind of not just let it loose on the internet and say this is the way it has to be, because there's also what um, your colleague was talking about the, the the fact of variation. I mean, if you've made a couple of videos, then it might be good to switch to audio just for the sake of variation and, and vice versa. So it, it's kind of complicated, but the the fact that the exhaustive knowledge, that's the word I'm using, I'm looking for a better term, that's where it, where it hinged for me, that that you kind of, if, if you expect your students to know all the dates for, I don't know, a certain era and everything that happened, please don't use just audio, combine it or just move to text and then use your audio to like kind of set the scene of, of a certain battle that you want them to remember something something like that that's what we're trying to work out um and i also we want to get into real soundscaping now like um using it for storytelling uh purposes um and we don't have any experience so i was wondering if um if you have any free resources that you could recommend um basically um it, it came very close to what that um, that audio clip you 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 let us listen to, where the leader is kind of in a crisis, that that kind of thing. Do you have any resources to make that type of audio that you could recommend? Uh, I can. Uh, I think we're going to be sh sharing with Dovi some some links and maybe some book titles and things like that. And I think Dovi will share with you next week. So I will. I'll have a, a look and see something very specific in that area that could possibly be helpful to you. Okay, meanwhile, Ben has put a very good tip in the, the chat with regard to trying to convince people to to use or to pay attention to the choice of, of uh, audio device, microphone or so. Uh, thank you very much for that, Ben. Yeah, no problem. It's not, obviously it doesn't help with in person um but uh i found it really really quite useful um i could make another point about it was raised earlier about um uh you know the faculty not really understanding the importance of audio and 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 you know the comment was made about you know do they have ears i think it's important to remember that they they're not actors they're not in this space um fully trained 
So as as professionals in this area, we we sometimes forget that, uh, and we take for granted, sorry, the the knowledge that we have that is not common across um, faculty in general. So it does take a little bit of coaxing, um, and also a lot of faculty kind of just you know they want to come in and they want to do their thing and then go because they've got research to do, they've got classes to teach, you know whatever it is. So they're there for the the, the thing. They don't really want to learn a new. St- well, I say they don't want to learn a new skill, but they they're not as they're not as into it as us, right? So 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 it's not surprising that they're not want to gonna they're not going to want to dedicate much time to to learning that if if they're only going to use it periodically in the sessions with us. So I think that remembering that is 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 a way to for us not to get frustrated. I've been in that situation a, a couple of times. I mean, we must have all been in that situation as well. Um, and 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 working with them to uh you know how we want them to sound with you know the like so uh, what kind of delivery do they do we want out of them and how and how best can we um how best can we kind of use an analogy that they will understand so give them give them a, a scenario that they are, are always in and then they'll go oh yeah i see what you mean um i think that that's that's quite useful as well mm-hmm that's a very good point, Ben. Also, the fact that people are not really uh, used to listening to themselves, which which is a first hurdle. So they they don't listen critical to like what's the quality of the sound, but they listen like, oh my god, I sound awful, uh, which everybody does. Even actors keep doing that. So yeah, yeah, so it's complicated for them, definitely. As you say, they're not actors. But on the other hand, um, how do we convince them that if they don't do it well from the first time and don't pay attention, that it may be, and I refer to that little example video that I showed at the very beginning that I want to show uh, at, at the end again, but then slightly different. So here, in that case, you have to say, well, sorry, it's not usable, so you wasted time. Or are you going to say, do it again, so you're going to waste two times? Or what, what are you going to do? So I, I think we need to convince them to please trust us. We we have ears, we will listen to you, we will be your critical ear. So I don't know, it's, it's complicated. Lana. One of the things that we do is that we will let them record an audio clip and then we ask them to share it with people, share it with your TAs, share it with a couple of students. And you'd be amazed how these young students do not mind giving you very strong critiques about how you sound. And it usually it's them that get the faculty member to change how they're gonna do it. Because this is your audience. Good point. That's a nice idea to have like a student review panel. Yeah, very good point. Maybe even in in all kinds of productions, it's a good point. Peter. I was just reflecting on um, what Ben said about academics claiming to be very busy. I mean, presuming that is one advantage of doing audio only in that it takes less time to teach someone to do produce good audio than it takes to teach them to produce a good video. And maybe that could actually be one of the selling points if we're trying to get more people to do more audio. Absolutely. Yeah, mm. it's a very good point. But a lot of the content is is based on documents, on, on visual stuff like on PowerPoints with they share or documents, PDFs, I don't know what. So for for Academics, it's quite easy, in fact, to say just, I'm going to use that, that's my visual stuff, and I'm going to talk over that. So uh, it's their kind of, they don't have to rewrite a scenario in one way or the other, not in the format of a video or in the format of even a, of an, a, a radio play or an, a podcast. So they, they say, I, I just have the text in front of me on the slides and I blurb over it. And then they, then for example, you say let's uh, just, or they say, you, do, you don't have to, you don't need the camera. Uh, just, just I read over it. What do you think of that? Is that in any way to be made effective? Some, I mean, sometimes, I mean, there's lots of variables, of course, but sometimes um, I will work with them and do it their way. <laughs> And once I've developed a bit of a relationship with them, I might say, um, "Okay, just tell me about this. Tell me, you know." I might, I, I, I've, I've also become the naive student, and I've tried to absorb as much as possible. And then I sort of 
I'm a bit of a, uh, you know, I hide in plain sight and I become the student and I provoke them and I record it. And if, if, if you get a conversational style, sometimes that's a way of getting uh, uh, something that suits an audio conversational medium. So you can sort of um, do it their way first for them, almost like a dress, re in my head, it's a dress rehearsal. Um, you know, it depends on your, the demands on your time and your remit and all that as well. But uh, we've got some really good recordings. So it's essentially an in conversation with, but 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 we've done it by, you know, sec secretly. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's well, one, one way of getting around it. Mm. Talk, and talking about the, the, the PowerPoint thing, of course, we get a lot of that as well. But what we do is we use their PowerPoint that they already created for a lesson. And our case is very specific because our students are exclusive online students and uh in asynchronous so they need to to give us content and sometimes we like i was saying we get these powerpoints that they use on their classrooms but we redo the graphics and we ask them to to write the text uh a shorter version in text of that powerpoint we then get them to record that short uh script let's call it a script and but we redo the powerpoint in a way and it happens often that a 20 minute powerpoint we reduce to five mm. you know and of course this all reflects on student retention as well because if you create a course that is boring for the students chances are we're going to be losing people along the way so that's a strong argument for for them as well we want to keep the students there start the course yeah yeah, yeah. Very good point. Also, very good point, Tim, about uh, uh, academics, teachers, very, very good podcast hosts. That's correct. It is, uh, it's because, yeah, um, you often say that teachers are born actors. They have to stand in front of an audience and keep them uh, engaged. So it should be possible indeed for them. Elke. Yeah, I wanted to come back to what you said about the, um, the talking head videos. There's like a couple of... Um, course teams that don't want to listen to reason and they, ju they just say okay i'm just going to do my presentation and then it's really like academic narration over a boring powerpoint okay we have no like authority to stop them in certain formats so we just let them uh, let them do their thing but then we show them the analytics <laughs> and you can see like the intro video everyone who's enrolled clicks on it and then they just they drop off so we basically show them the analytics we say okay you worked for a whole year on this and, you know, five people stuck around. And in the end, only three people are watching. So is this really what you want? Or should we do like for the next run? Should we take a different approach? That's really powerful. <laughs> Very painful. <laughs> yeah. Really powerful. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Um, if there's no no other urgent question, I, I would like to go back to the, the beginning of the of the program, if you don't mind. Um, and I, I will run just for those people that didn't see the video, I'll just run a couple of seconds of the video. Um, here it goes. Dear colleague, dear friends, as president of the European Society of Gynecoendoscopy. So yeah, there's all kinds of things to say about the video. It's, as as uh, Nick also said, camera is too far away, it's the wrong microphone, it's a camera that's wind sensitive, it's too much wind, it's the wrong location, uh, I don't know what. So disastrous and what do you all say that you would do you say for the majority do you see the result now yeah so majority says we'll send the team and the professor back for a reshoot well extra time extra cost maybe it's not possible anymore because i don't know what professor has has had to travel and is in south america god knows what reason that there is we refuse to distribute. Very, very brave. We asked the professor to comment over dub in the audio studio. Yeah, good point. We subtitle. Very creative. We have software that deals with this. Okay. Um, I guess that's Nick who said that he's talking about isotope. Nick, is that correct? Or I don't know who, who said that and what software are you talking about? Anybody? I think that was probably Dominic. Me. I was thinking about ah. things like uh, Adobe Audition. On one hand, it'd be a really hard 
fix. But oh, okay. Probably try it there first before making a response. Yep. And if not, I'd also try running it through something like Adobe Podcast Enhance as well. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about the AI option as well, which yep. does tidy things up really quite nicely before I made a decision to ask him to redo it. Yeah, good good point. Um, in fact, you, if you go on YouTube and you put in a remove noise, uh, remove wind noise and things like that, you get all kinds of tips with, with Indeed, with Adobe uh, Audition and so on. But um, and now I'm going to show you something quite shocking. Uh, this is not an advertisement, so don't take it as that. Uh, I'm not even going to say with what this is done, but uh, this is after treatment. Geocollectic Friends, as president of the Urban State of Vinical in Um I would like again to invite you uh, to join us in our next uh, Congress Questions next on Polo. Good. Um, you remember the last video message from my friend Antilo Dispedio in Dolomites to promote also this event. So that's why for me it was impossible to propose to you all the mountains. We are here in the range seven mountains, mountains, the sea just above there, and it's our thoughts. To the success of. Okay. Eric. Still sounds like shit. Pardon my language. <laughs> it's very true, but I think it is up to let's say fifty percent rescued. It's it's not completely lost anymore. What do you think? Who uh, says who uh, says you can live with it? Eric, go ahead. It's it's uh, still yeah, I was still shit. It was still like several words that were still inaudible. Um, so it's still useless. And I mean, even if someone comes to me with something like this, I'll be annoyed that they're wasting my time because they should know better that this is useless. So yeah, I'll send them back anytime, you know, 10 out of 10 times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you have a point indeed, but... Uh, I'm an old grouch. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have no choice, well, this is this was AI uh, let loose on the clip. So it was the, the, the client, this professor was happy uh, with it because well as i said they are not listening critically as you are eric and they say well at least i can understand myself i can hear something so um and this is the first bits of ai in audio i, I find it quite uh, quite impressive but i i agree with you it's not what you want you started in the wrong place well, you, should, you should go back and start yeah, again yeah. It, it is impressive that it yeah. cleaned it up that yeah. much though and i know that ai probably can do wonders and you know maybe you know six months from now ai could do even better than this but uh yeah but, maybe, so yeah maybe in six months we don't need a professor anymore yeah um, Nick. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah i was gonna say that um I, you had sent that clip to us uh, early, and I, I kind of played around with it a little bit and had basically the same results with the uh, Adobe uh, podcast thing. Um, I have had some success uh, working with some of our classes where I'll do a bunch, as much cleanup as I can possibly do in Isotope RX, um, where it's like more intelligible, but it doesn't sound good. And mm -hmm. then running that audio through um adobe uh the adobe podcast ai stuff well i don't know what that software is doing but it's like generating harmonics and stuff and as long as the as long as the voice and the noise are far enough apart um you'll you'll be able to understand the words a little better so uh, basically i've had i've had some luck kind of daisy chaining processes mm. ben you have any thoughts uh yeah i mean clearly it still sounds pretty poor i think in this is in this situation i think the um considering the end result right the end view of the student um is the key priority here and their ability to digest and understand that information so in if 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 you were forced to put that out and and that was the only thing that you could go with then you would have to put some some sort of subtitling on it because you've, you've also got to bear in mind the you know students with you know, English is not their first language. Mm -hmm. So if you don't do that, you immediately exclude um, a, a large portion of a, of a student base who they're just not going to engage with it because they're immediately going to hear this poor audio and then, you know, they're just going to immediately have that drop off. 
uh, that Elka was talking about earlier. So um, I would do a, you know, if this was forced, I'd do, you know, uh, subtitling, you know, you, it's not always possible to to send them back to go and go and reshoot. And again, they don't really care about what they've done. They're just like, you asked me to do this. I did it. Here you go. So you, you know, kind of have to polish, polish something eventually, don't you? Thank you. Thank you, Ben. With these.